Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of D News Plus. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Amy, filling in for Trace all this week. This is episode five of five about NASA's Gemini space program. So far, we've talked about the origins of the Gemini program after Mercury and before Apollo went to the moon. We've talked about how to travel in space for a long time using fuel cells. We've talked about spacewalks and how dangerous they are and some fun stories about that. And we've talked about rendezvous and docking in space and some other fun stories about how dangerous that is. Today, we're going to be talking about the end of a Gemini mission, which is how to return to Earth and splashdowns. If this is the first episode in the series that you're watching, be sure to go back and check out the episodes that you missed, and be sure to subscribe so you get all future series in one go. One of the goals of the Gemini program that is never discussed is that Gemini was the program that NASA hoped would be the first to land on land, land on a runway like an airplane. So the Gemini spacecraft, like Mercury and Apollo, was a blunt-bodied spacecraft. It didn't have wings, it wasn't able to fly like an airplane, but NASA didn't really like splashdowns that much. If you think about what a splashdown is, it's really just letting the spacecraft fall out of orbit, you know, with control through the atmosphere and then land in the ocean. The ocean is big. It's a big target. It's yielding to a spacecraft falling into it. And it doesn't need any control from the astronaut. It was the easiest thing for the Mercury program to just let splashdowns be the way they would come back. The problem was, NASA didn't have a Navy. NASA had to employ the US Navy to recover the astronauts from the ocean. This was a very costly experience. And also, the astronauts weren't exactly just guys off the street. The astronauts were ace pilots. These were men who could land airplanes full of bullet holes in the dark with no power. I mean, these guys could land anything. Now they're just being plucked out of the ocean like wet rats. One example of just how insane the naval forces were for recovery, when Wally Shura ended his Sigma 7 mission in 1962, this was a Mercury mission, there were 27 ships on hand to pull the one man out of the ocean. This was a massive use of resources, costly, it meant that the spacecraft could not be reused because they were expo- it was exposed to salt water and would start rusting. Um, there was always the, the risk of an astronaut drowning, which Gus Grissom almost did after his Liberty Bell 7 Mercury flight in 1961. If the hatch popped too early, which was what happened to Grissom, it filled up with, with water and would just sink like a stone. Grissom's capsule wasn't recovered until 1999 from the bottom of the Atlantic. So NASA really wanted to move away from splashdowns and start using the fact that the astronauts were pilots to land on a runway. And so it developed this system called the Regalo Wing. And it's, if you've never seen it, I would recommend Googling Gemini Regalo Wing for a picture of it. It's quite a different thing than you've probably ever seen if you're sort of cursorily engaged with spaceflight. The Regalo Wing was essentially a two-lobed sail, so you can kind of imagine it as a triangular kite such that the Each of the three points are connected to the spacecraft, as well as the point in the middle of the bottom edge. So it sort of had two wings over the spacecraft. The idea was, as it re-entered the atmosphere, the Gemini spacecraft would have um, it would have a heat shield. It would re-enter just like any any Mercury mission did. Uh, the heat shield would kind of burn away and protect the astronaut. And then this wing would unfurl and inflate, and the astronaut would be able to um, manipulate the center of gravity of the mated wing and spacecraft to gain enough control to land on little wheels on a runway. So this blunt spacecraft that would fall could easily fall from the sky into the ocean would be able to land under control on a runway landing, negating the need to hire a huge chunk of the U.S. Navy to pluck the astronauts out of the ocean. The problem was the Regalo wing concept needed a lot of time to develop, and time was not something NASA had in the 1960s. Originally, the Regalo wing was the main system and splashdown landing, just like Mercury, just a parachute to slow the descent to to an ocean landing, was the backup system. But as the Gemini program wore on and other more important goals like rendezvous, like long duration flight, like EVAs, as those goals kind of took precedence, the runway landing system, the Regalo wing, was slowly kind of pushed to the back burner and then the further back burner. And eventually it was just completely ousted from this from the program. Um, it was never used. And it's interestingly, it was 165 million dollar program in 1962 dollars, which is about 2.1 billion in 2010 dollars for something that never came to be. Um, I think the most interesting thing to come out of the the Gemini Regalo program, there was a test tow vehicle. So this was a small scale Gemini with 
the wing on top that an astronaut could sit in or a pilot could sit in, it would be dropped from a helicopter and the pilot would have to fly it to a runway landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California. One of those pilots, and the only one who didn't go to the hospital flying this thing, was Jack Swigert, who then flew on Apollo 13. Uh, some of you guys may recognize his name. Kevin Bacon played him in the 1995 movie. So the goal of moving away from splashdown landings and figuring out how to land on a runway and then reuse the spacecraft ideally was the only goal of the Gemini program that wasn't met. But ultimately, it kind of wasn't a huge deal in the scheme of things. The Gemini program did amazingly well. There were 10 manned missions, 12 including the two unmanned missions, in just 20 months. And that is the fastest turnaround time NASA has ever had for uh, on the course of a whole spaceflight program. And really, everything came together on Gemini 12. Gemini 12 was the last mission in December of 1966, and it did all the things. The commander on this mission was Jim Lovell, and the the rookie pilot was Edwin Buzz Aldrin. Um, they rendezvoused and docked with the Aegean target vehicle. They were only up for about three days, but they knew at this point Lovell's earlier Gemini mission, Gemini 7, had proved that fuel cells could last for 14 days. And they also did um, some successful spacewalks on this flight. So everything that the Gemini program had to do really was done on this one mission. It really kind of tied it up all beautifully. Just splashed down in the ocean, unfortunately, like every other Gemini mission did. But it splashed down well. It splashed down on target, so that was a good thing. During the last three Apollo missions, there were deep space EVAs. So midway between the Earth and the Moon on the return journey, an astronaut actually stepped outside to recover film canisters from the outside of the spacecraft. And that, to me, boggles my mind, because I can't think of anything scarier than stepping outside of my nice, cozy spacecraft and hoping my spacesuit totally works when the closest thing is an, an eighth of a million miles away. That's just freaky to me. NASA also knew at this point how to rendezvous and dock, how to connect the spacecraft, such that when Apollo launched, all the astronauts who had to do this knew how to to fly towards a spacecraft, how to do these rendezvous in lunar orbit, but also midway to the moon to recover the lunar module. All of the pieces of Apollo were really worked out in the Gemini program. So without the Gemini program to teach NASA how to fly in space and to teach the astronauts how to work in space and do everything they had to do, the Apollo program couldn't have been as successful as it was. Of course, the Apollo program didn't fly the Gemini spacecraft. The Apollo program had the command and service modules as well as the lunar module. And the program had its own challenges. Though all of the, the technologies and the basic mission parameters were set and understood, NASA had to still go through all of these phases with the new spacecraft to prove the spacecraft at the same time as proving that it could do everything that it the astronauts did in Gemini. So there is still a learning curve with Apollo, but without Gemini to kind of bridge between the Earth and the Moon, Apollo wouldn't have been able to do everything that it did. So that was the Gemini program, the program that taught NASA how to fly in space and built the bridge to the Moon. So now that you know a little bit more about the Gemini program, and there's always more to know, what do you guys think about it? Do you think we've done enough to honor the accomplishments of this amazing program, or would you like to know more? And speaking of knowing more, Apollo had to go through its own learning curve. Would you like to know a little bit more about how Apollo got from Earth orbit to standing on the surface of the moon? Or even how Mercury went from these short little suborbital flights to 34 hours in space? Let me know if you'd like to know more in the comments below. We might come back for another series. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe so you get all the future series of DNews Plus directly into your inbox. And thank you so much for letting me guest host for this entire week. If you want to hear this series again or any previous DNews Plus series, be sure to find the podcast on iTunes. And if you want more from me, you can find me over on DNews or you can find me talking more old space over on my own channel, Vintage Space. You can also find me on Twitter. I'm at AST Vintage Space. Thank you so much for watching, guys.